Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Adventure Mystery Book Club. I'm Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library, and I'm so glad you could join me for today's reading of Whose Body by Dorothy L. Sayers. Uh, on Wednesday, we read uh, chapters one and two, and were introduced to Lord Peter Whimsey, who has taken it upon himself to be a um, gentleman detective along the lines of uh, Sherlock Holmes. He even references Sherlock Holmes in the, in one of the chapters. And he uh, has uh, just heard from his mother, of all people, the, the Dowager Duchess, uh, that someone has found a dead body in their bathtub. Well, upon finding out more information, uh, the dead body, uh, wearing nothing but a uh, pince-nez, which is a uh, a little uh, eyeglasses that a pinch on the bridge of your nose, uh, and nothing else, uh, in the bathtub uh, of a Mr. Thipps. And there's no apparent reason for it. Nobody can quite figure out why or how any of this happened. So... Uh, Whimsy goes over to uh, talk to Mr. Thipps and his uh, almost deaf mother, and uh, while there, almost runs astray of a, uh, a police inspector by the name of Sug, who is uh, generally considered uh, by the narrative to be not a very good police officer. Um, later on, when he uh, is back home and he is talking to uh, another uh, uh member of the police force, a uh, Mr. Parker. Uh, Parker kind of s implies that Sug will no doubt arrest Thipps and probably arrest his mother, not because he has any evidence against them, but just because he needs to arrest somebody and they are there and they're handy. So <clears throat> generally speaking, not a, not a very good police officer, although Parker seems to be uh, a much better, and he seems to be a, a friend and a confidant of uh, Lord Peter Whimsey. And um, that's kind of where we're at right now, in that they're trying to, to figure out, they're, they're wondering if this uh, body is the, uh, the missing financier by the name of Levy. Uh, they have not found any evidence to that, but that would make a kind of sense because he's this person is missing and here's this dead body they have already discovered that this is a wealthy man but not a man who has um had wealth his entire life um they found on the body uh, little red dots which are they discovered to be flea bites so this man was was clearly uh you know, dealing with fleas, that he had uh, a beard uh, until recently, and that uh, it is believed that he was shaved uh, clean post-mortem. So he was killed first and then um, and then shaved uh, off the beard because they could find uh, little bits of, of soap and stubble and, and, and cut hair, not only on the body, but also in his mouth. So it was, you know, clearly not something that you know, he did himself, you know, it wasn't something where he, he had done this um, the morning of kind of thing before he was murdered because it was some of the soap and the hair got into his mouth and it, he it, he was not in a position to get rid of it. So so they're, they're still kind of mulling this over uh, as we begin our third chapter. So if you are ready, we will do this. The chapters do not have uh, heading titles, so it's just going to be chapter three. Lord Peter finished a Scarlatti sonata and sat looking thoughtfully at his own hands. The fingers were long and muscular with wide, flat joints and square tips. When he was playing, his rather hard gray eyes softened and his long, intermediate, uh, indeterminate mouth hardened in compensation. At no other time had he any pretensions to good looks, and at, and at all times he was spoilt by a long, narrow chin and a long, receding forehead, accentuated by the brushed-back sleekness of his tow-colored hair. Labor papers softening down, uh, softening down the chin uh, caricatured him as a, a typical aristocrat. That was a wonderful instrument, said Parker. 
It ain't so bad, said Lord Peter, but Scarlatti wants a harpsichord, pianos too modern, all thrills and overtones, no good for our job, Parker. Have you come to any conclusion? The man in the bath, said Parker, methodically, was not a well-off man careful of his personal appearance. He was a laboring man, unemployed, but who had only recently lost his employment. He had been tramping about looking for a job when he met with his end. Somebody killed him and washed him and scented him and shaved him in order to disguise him and put him into Thip's bath without leaving a trace. Conclusion? The murderer was a powerful man since he killed him with a single blow on the neck, a man of cool head and masterly intellect. Since he did not, uh, since he did all that ghastly business without leaving a mark, a man of wealth and refinement, since he had all the apparatus of an elegant toilet handy, and a man of bizarre and almost perverted imagination, as is shown in the two horrible touches of putting the body in the bath and of adorning it with a pair of pince nez. He is a poet of crime, said Whimsy. By the way, your difficulty about the pince-nez is cleared up. Obviously, the pince-nez never belonged to the body. That only makes a fresh puzzle. One can't suppose the murderer left them in that uh, obliging manner as a clue to his own identity. We can hardly suppose that. I'm afraid this man possessed what most criminals lack, a sense of humor. Rather macabre humor... True, but a man who can afford to be humorous at all in such circumstances is a terrible fellow. I wonder what he did with the body between the murder and depositing it Shea Thipps. Then there are more questions. How did he get there? How did he get it there? And why? Was it brought in at the door, as Sug of our heart suggests, or through the window, as we might, on the very on the not very adequate testimony of a smudge on the window sill, Had the murderer accomplices? Is little Thipps really in it, or the girl? It don't do to put the notion out of court merely because Sug inclines to, inclines to it. Even idiots occasionally speak the truth accidentally. If not, why was Thipps selected for such an abominable practical joke? Has anybody got a grudge against Thips? Who are the people in the other flats? We must find out that. Does Thips play the piano at midnight over their heads or damage the reputation of the staircase by bringing home dubiously respectable ladies? Are there unsuccessful architects thirsting for his blood? Damn it all, Parker, there must be a motive somewhere. Can't have a crime without a motive, you know. A madman, suggested Parker, doubtfully. With a deuced lot of method in his madness, he hasn't made a mistake, not one, unless leaving hairs in the corpse's mouth can be called a mistake. Well, anyhow, it's not Levy. You're right there. I say, old thing, uh, ne neither your man nor mine has left much clue t to go upon, has he? And there don't seem to be any motives knocking about either and we seem to be two suits of clothes short in last night's work. Sir Reuben makes tracks without so much as a fig leaf, and a mysterious individual turns up in a pince-nez which is quite useless for purposes of decency. Dash it all! If only I had some good excuse for taking up this body case officially. The telephone rang. Telephone, the telephone bell rang. The silent bunter, whom the other two had almost forgotten, padded across to it. "'It is an elderly lady, my lord,' he said. "'I think she's deaf. I can't make her hear anything, but she's asking for your lordship.' Lord Peter seized the receiver and yelled into it a, "'Hello!' that might have cracked the vulcanite. He listened for some minutes with an incredulous smile, which gradually broadened into a grin of delight. At length, he screamed, All right! All right! several times, and rang off. 
By Jove, he announced, beaming. Sport an old bird. It's old Mrs. Thipps, deaf as a post. Never used the phone before, but determined. Perfect Napoleon. The incomparable Sug has made a discovery and arrested little Thipps. Old lady abandoned in the flat. Thipps last shrieked to her, Tell Lord Peter Whimsey. Old girl undaunted, restless with telephone book. Uh, wakes up the people at the exchange. Won't take no for an answer, not being able to hear it. Gets through, says, Will I do what I can? Says she would feel safe in the hands of a real gentleman. Oh, Parker, Parker, I could kiss her, I really could, as Thipps said. I'll write to her instead. No, hang it, Parker, we'll go round. Bunter, get your infernal machine and the magnesium. I say, we'll all go into partnership, pool the two cases and work them together, work them out together. You shall see my body tonight, Parker, and I'll look for your wandering Jew tomorrow. I feel so happy. I shall explode. Oh, sug, sug, how art thou suggified? Bunter, my shoes, I say, Parker. I suppose yours are rubber-soled? Not? Tut, tut, you mustn't go out like that. We'll lend you a pair. Gloves? Here. My stick, my torch, the lamp black, the forceps, knife, pill boxes, all complete? Certainly, my lord. Oh, Bunter, don't look so offended. I mean no harm. I believe in you. I trust you. What money have I got? That'll do. I knew a man once, Parker, who let a world-famous poisoner slip through his fingers because the machine on the underground took nothing but pennies. There was a queue at the booking office, and the man at the barrier stopped him, and while they were arguing about accepting a five-pound note, which was all he had, for a two-penny ride to Baker Street, the criminal had sprung into a circle train and was next heard of in Constantinople, disguised as an elderly Church of England clergyman touring with his niece. Are we all ready? Go. And they stepped out, Bunter carefully switching off the lights behind them. As they emerged into the gloom and gleam of Piccadilly, Whimsy stopped short with a little exclamation. Wait a second, he said. I've thought of something. If Sug there, if Sug's there, he'll make trouble. I must short-circuit him. He ran back, and the other two men employed the few minutes of his absence in capturing a taxi. Inspector Sug and a subordinate, Cerberus, were on guard at 59 Queen Carolyn Mansions, and showed no disposition to admit unofficial inquirers. Parker, indeed, uh, they could Parker, indeed, they could not only easily turn away, but Lord Peter found himself confronted with a surly manner and what Lord Beaconsfield described as a masterly inactivity. It was in vain that Lord Peter pleaded that he had been retained by Mrs. Thipps on behalf of her son. Retained, said Inspector Sugg with a snort. She'll be retained if she doesn't look out. Shouldn't wonder if she wasn't in it herself. Only she's so deaf, she's no good for anything at all. Look here, Inspector, said Lord Peter. What's the use of being so belly obstructive? You'd much better let me in. You know I'll get there in the end. Dash it all, it's not as if I was taking the bread out of your children's mouths. Nobody paid me for finding Lord Attenbury's emeralds for you. It's my duty to keep out the public, said Inspector Sugg morosely, and it's going to stay out. I never said anything about your keeping out the public, said Lord Peter, easily sitting down on the staircase to thrash the matter out comfortably. Though I've no doubt pussyfoot, puss, pussyfoot's a good thing, on principle, if not exaggerated. The golden mean, Sugg, as Aristotle says, keeps you from being a golden ass. Ever been a golden ass, Sugg? I have. It would take a whole rose garden to cure me, Sugg. 
You are my garden of beautiful roses, my own rose, my own, my one rose, that's you. I'm not going to stay any longer talking to you, said the harassed Sug. It's bad enough. Hello. Drat that telephone. Here, Cawthorn, go and see what it is. If it's that old catamaran, we'll let you into the room, shuddering herself up there and screaming said the inspector. It's enough to make a man give up crime and take to hedging and ditching. The constable came back. It's from the yard, sir, he said, coughing apologetically. The chief says every facility is to be given to Lord Peter Whimsey, sir. Um, he stood apart, non-committally glazing his eyes. Five aces, said Lord Peter, cheerfully. The chief's a dear friend of my mother's. No, go, Sug. It's no good, Buckin. You've got a full house. I'm going to make it a bit fuller. He walked in with his followers. The body had been removed a few hours previously, and when the bathroom and the whole flat had been explored by the naked eye and the camera of the competent bunter, it became evident that the real problem of the household was old Mrs. Thipps. Her son and servant had both been removed, and it appeared that they had uh, no friends in town beyond a few business acquaintances of Thipps, whose very addresses the, uh, the old lady did not know. The other flats in the building were occupied, respectively, by a family of seven at present departed to winter abroad, an elderly Indian colonel of ferocious manners who lived alone with an Indian manservant, and a highly respectable family on the third floor whom the disturbance over their heads had outraged to the last degree. The husband, indeed, when appealed to by Lord Peter, showed a little human weakness, but Mrs. Appledore, appearing suddenly in a warm uh, dressing gown, extricated him from the difficulties into which he was carelessly wandering. "'I am sorry,' she said. I'm afraid we can't interfere in any way. This is a very unpleasant business, Mr... I'm afraid I didn't catch your name, and we have always found it better not to be mixed up with the police. Of course, if the Thips are innocent, and I'm sure, I'm, I am sure I hope they are, it is very unfortunate for them. But I must say that the circumstances seem to me most suspicious, and to Theophilus too, and I should not like to have it said that we had assisted murderers. We might even be supposed to be accessories. Of course, you are young, Mr. Uh, uh, this is Lord Peter Whimsey, my dear, said Theophilus mildly. She was unimpressed. Ah, yes, she said. I believe that you are distantly related to my late cousin, the Bishop of Carisbrook, poor man. He was always being taken in by impostors. He died without ever learning any better. I imagine you take after him, Lord Peter. I doubt it, said Lord Peter. So far as I know, he is only a connection, though uh, it's a wise child that knows its own father. I congratulate you, dear lady, on taking after the other side of the family. You'll forgive my button in upon you like this in the middle of the night, though, as you say, it's all in the family, and I'm sure I'm very much obliged to you, and for permitting me to admire that awfully fetching thing you've got on. Now, don't you worry, Mr. Appledore. I'm thinking the best thing I can do is to trundle the old lady down to my mother and take her out of your way. Otherwise, you might be finding your Christian feelings getting the better of you some fine day, and there's nothing like Christian feelings for upsetting a man's domestic comfort. Good night, sir. Good night, dear lady. It's simply ripping of you to let me drop in like this. Well, said Mrs. Appledore, and the door closed behind him. And... I thank the goodness and the grace that my birth have smiled, said Lord Peter, and taught me to be bestial, uh, bestially impertinent when I choose. Cat? 2 a.m. saw Lord Peter Whimsey arrive in a friend's car at the Dower House, Den Denver Castle, in the company 
and in company with a deaf and aged lady and an at antique portmanteau. It's very nice to see you, dear, said the Dowager Duchess placidly. She was a small, plump woman with perfectly white hair and exquisite hands. In feature, she was as unlike her second son as she was like him in character. Her black eyes twinkled cheerfully, and her manners and movements were marked with a neat and rapid decision. She wore a charming wrap from Liberty's and sat watching Lord Peter eat cold beef and cheese as though his arrival in such incongruous circumstances and company were the most ordinary event possible, which, with him, indeed, it was. "'Have you got the old lady to bed?' asked Lord Peter. "'Oh, yes, dear, such a striking old person. Isn't she and very courageous? She tells me she has never been in a motor-car before, but she thinks you a very nice lad, dear. That careful of her, you remind her of her own son, poor little Mr. Thipps. Whatever made your friend the inspector think that he could have murdered anybody?' My friend, the inspector, no, no more, thank you, mother, is determined to prove that the intrusive person in Thipp's bath is Sir Reuben Levy, who disappeared mysteriously from his house last night. His line of reasoning is, we've lost a middle-aged gentleman without any clothes on in Park Lane. We've found a middle-aged gentleman without any clothes on in Battersea. Therefore, they're one and the same person, Q-E-D, and put little Thips in quad. You're very elliptical, dear, said the Duchess mildly. Why should Mr. Thips be arrested even if, they're, even if they are the same? Sug must arrest somebody, said Lord Peter, but there is one odd little bit of evidence come out which goes a long way to support Sug's theory only that I know it to be no go by the evidence of my own eyes. Last night, about 9.15, a young woman was strolling up the Battersea Park Road for purposes best known to herself when she saw a gentleman in a fur coat and top hat sauntering along under an umbrella, looking at the names of all the streets. He looked a bit out of place. So, not being a shy girl, you see, she walked up to him and said, "'Good evening,' Can you please, uh, can you please, I'm sorry, can you tell me, please, says the mysterious stranger, whether this street leads into Prince of Wales Road? She said it did, and further asked him in a jocular manner what he was doing with himself and all the rest of it, only she wasn't altogether so explicit about that part of the conversation, because she was unburdening her heart to Sug, do you see? And he's paid by a, a grateful county country to have very pure, high-minded ideals. What? Anyway, the old boy said he couldn't attend to her just then, as he had had an appointment. I've got to go and see a man, my dear, was how, he, how she said he put it. And he walked on up Alexandra Avenue towards Prince of Wales Road. She was staring after him, still rather surprised, when she was joined by a friend of hers who said, It's no good wasting your time with him. That's Levy. I knew him when I lived in the West End, and the girls used to call him P. Green Incorruptible. Friend's name suppressed, owing to implications of story, but girl vouches for what was said. She thought no more about it till the milkman brought news this morning of the excitement at Queen Carolyn Mansions. Then she went round, though not liking the police as a rule, and asked the man there whether the dead gentleman had a beard and glasses. Told he had glasses but no beard, she incautiously said, Oh, then it isn't him. And the man said, Isn't who? And collared her. That's her story. Suggs delighted, of course, and quadded Thipps on the strength of it. "'Dear me,' said the Duchess, "'I hope the poor girl won't get into trouble.' "'I shouldn't think so,' said Lord Peter. "'Thipps is the one that's going to get, uh, get it in the neck. "'Besides, 
He's done a silly thing. I got that out of Sug, too. Though he was sitting tight on the information, seems Thipps got into a confusion about the train he took back from Manchester. Said first he got home at 10.30. Then they pumped Gladys Horrocks, who let out he wasn't back till after 11.45. Then Thipps, being asked to explain the discrepancy, stammers and bungles and says first that he missed the train. Then Sug makes inquiries at St. Pancras and discovers that he left a bag in the cloakroom there at 10. Thipps, again asked to explain, stammers worse and says he walked about for a few hours, met a friend, can't say who, didn't meet a friend, can't say what he did with his time, can't explain why he didn't go back for his bag, can't say what time he did get in, can't explain how he got a bruise on his forehead. In fact, can't explain himself at all. Gladys Horrocks interrogated again, says this time Thipps came in at 10.30, then admits she didn't hear him come in. Can't say why she didn't hear him come in. Can't say why she said first of all that she did hear him. Bursts into tears, contradicts herself. Everybody's suspicion roused. Quadum both. As you put it, dear, said the Duchess, it all sounds very confusing and not quite respectable. Poor little Mr. Thipps would be terribly upset by anything that wasn't respectable. I wonder what he did with himself, said Lord Peter, thoughtfully. I really don't think he was committing a murder. Besides, I believe that fellow has been dead a day or two, though it don't do to build too much on doctor's evidence. It's an entertaining little problem. Very curious, dear, but so sad about poor Mr. S poor Sir Reuben. I must write a few lines to Lady Levy. I used to know her quite well, you know, dear, down in Hampshire when she was a girl. Christine Ford she was then, and I remember so well the dreadful trouble there was about her marrying a Jew. That was before he made his money, of course, in that oil business out in America. The family wanted her to marry Julian Freak, who did so well afterwards and was connected with the family, but she fell in love with this Mr. Levy and eloped with him. He was very handsome then, you know, dear, in a foreign-looking way. But he hadn't any means, and the Fords didn't like his religion. Of course, we're all Jews nowadays, and they wouldn't have minded so much if he'd presented to be something else, like that Mr. Simons we met at Mr. Por and Mrs. Porchester's, who always tells everybody that he got his nose in Italy at, at the Renaissance, and claims to be descended somehow or other from La Bella Simon Simonetta. So foolish, you know, dear, as if anybody believed it. I'm sure some Jews are very good people, and personally I'd much rather they believed something, though, of course, it must be very inconvenient, what with not working on Sundays and uh, circumcising the poor little babies and everything depending on the new moon and that funny kind of meat they have with the with such a slang sounding name and never being able to have bacon for breakfast still there it was and it was much better for the girl to marry him if she was really fond of him though i believe young freak was really devoted to her and they they're still great friends not that there was ever a real engagement, only a sort of understanding with her father, and she never married, uh, and he, but he's never married, you know, and lives all by himself in that big house next to the hospital, though he's very rich and distinguished now. And I know ever so many people have tried to get a hold of him. There was Lady Mainwaring wanted him for that eldest girl of hers, though I remember saying at the time it was no use expecting a surgeon to be taken in by a figure that was all padding. They have so many opportunities of judging, you know, dear. 
Lady Le Levy seems to have the knack of making people devoted to her, said Peter. Look at the pea-green incorruptible Levy. That's quite true, dear. She was a most delightful girl, and they say her daughter is just like her. I rather lost sight of them when she married, and you know your father didn't care much for about business people. But I know everybody always said they were a model couple. In fact, it was a proverb that Sir Reuben was as well loved at home as he was hated abroad. I don't mean in foreign countries, you know, dear. Just the proverbial way of putting things, like a saint abroad and a devil at home, only the other way on, reminding one of the Pilgrim's progress. Yes, said Sir Peter. I dare say the old man made one or two enemies. Dozens, dear. Such a dreadful place, the city, isn't it? Everybody Ishmael's together, though I don't suppose Sir Reuben would like to be called that, would he? Doesn't it mean illegitimate or not a proper Jew, anyway? I always did get confused with those Old Testament characters. Lord Peter laughed and yawned. I think I'll turn in for an hour or two, he said. I must be back in town at eight. Parker's coming to breakfast. The Duchess looked at the clock, which marked five minutes to three. I'll send up your breakfast at half past six, dear, she said. I hope you'll find everything all right. I told them just to slip a hot water bottle in. Those linen sheets are so chilly and can put it out of it and put it out if it's in your way. And that, my friends is the end of chapter three. So we are moving on. Is it uh, Reuben Levy in the bath or is it not? And if it's not, then who is it? And what will they find out after having gone around? And of course, they've met the neighbors now as well. And Bunter has taken pictures and and we'll see once they uh, get together and uh, gets a chance to talk to Parker. I imagine that they will compare notes and we will see what happens. So that's the end of it for uh, for us. Thank you so much for joining me for our live reading of uh, Who's Body Chapter 3. Uh, please uh, join me again on Monday at 4 p.m. Uh, for We'll Read Chapter 4. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you again. Bye now.